1963 epic war film The Great Escape stars Steve McQueen, James Garner and Richard Attenborough and is arguably one of the best World War II movies ever made. It depicts a mass escape by British Commonwealth prisoners of war from German POW camp Stalag Luft Free during the Second World War. But how historically true to life is it? The movie is based on Paul Brickhill's 1950s non-fiction book of the same name. The film, however, makes numerous compromises for its commercial appeal, including its portrayal of American prisoners' involvement in the escape. The movie's characters are fictionous, though they are based on real men, in most cases being composites of several people. The writers significantly increased the involvement of American POWs, Though in real life, a few American officers in the camp initially helped dig the tunnels and worked on the early plans. However, they were moved away seven months before the escape, which ended their involvement. The real escape was by largely British and other Allied personnel, with the exception of American Johnny Dodge, who was a British officer. The film totally ignores the crucial role that the Canadians played in in building the tunnels and in the escape itself. Of the 1,800 or so POWs, 600 were involved in preparations. 150 of those were Canadian. Wally Floodley, an RCAF pilot and former miner who was the real life tunnel king, was engaged as a technical advisor for the film. In the movie, Captain Ramsey, played by James Donald, informs the commandant of the camp, von Luger, that it is the sworn duty of every officer to attempt to escape. In reality, there was no requirement in the King's regulations, or in any form of international convention. The film shows the tunnel codenamed Tom, with its entrance under a stove, and Harry's in a drain sump in a washroom. Though these codenames are correct, they are misplaced. In reality, Dick's entrance was at the drain sump, Harry's under the stove, and Tom's was in a darkened corner next to a stove chimney. The movie portrays that each POW brings something to the plan, but omits any mention that many Germans willingly helped in the escape itself. The film suggests that the forgers were able to make near exact replicas of just about any pass that was used in Nazi Germany. In reality, the forgers received a great deal of assistance from Germans who lived many of hundreds of miles away, on the other side of the country. Several German guards who were openly anti-Nazi also willingly gave the prisoners items and assistance of any kind to aid their escape. The need for such accuracy produced much eye strain, but unlike in the film, there were no cases of blindness. Some, such as Frank Knight, gave up forging because of the strain, but he certainly did not suffer the same ocular fate as the character of Colin Brythe in the film. It is correct how the film shows the hidden way it dispersed materials from the tunnels. The usual method of disposing of sand from all the digging was to scatter it discreetly on the surface. Small pouches made of towels or long underpants were attached inside the prisoners' trousers. As they walked around, the sand could be scattered. Sometimes they would dump the sand into a small garden they were allowed to tend. As one prisoner turned the soil, another would release the sand while they both appeared to be in conversation. The prisoners wore greatcoats to conceal the bulges from the sand and were referred to as penguins because of their supposed resemblance. Eventually the prisoners felt they could no longer dump sand above ground because the Germans became too efficient at catching them doing it. After Dick's planned exit point was covered by a new camp expansion, the decision was made to start filling it up. As the tunnel's entrance was very well hidden, Dick was also used as a storage room for items such as maps, postage stamps, forged travel permits, compasses and clothing. 
Some guards cooperated by supplying railway timetables, maps and many official papers so that they could be forged. Some genuine civilian clothes were obtained by bribing German staff with cigarettes, coffee or chocolate. These were used by escaping prisoners to travel from the camp more easily, especially by train. The film depicts the escape taking place in ideal weather conditions, whereas at the time much was done in freezing temperatures and snow lay thick on the ground. On Friday the 24th of March 1944, the escape attempt began. As night fell, those allocated a place moved to Hut 104. Unfortunately for the prisoners, the exit trapdoor of Harry was frozen solid, and unfreezing it delayed the escape by an hour and a half. Then it was discovered that the tunnel had come up short of the nearby forest. At 10.30pm, the first man out emerged just short of the tree line, close to a guard tower. As the temperature was below freezing and there was snow on the ground, a dark trail would be created by crawling to cover. To avoid being seen by the sentries, the escapes were reduced to about 10 per hour, rather than one every minute that had been planned. Word was eventually sent back that no one issued with a number above 100 would be able to get away before daylight, as they would be shot if caught trying to return to their own barracks. These men changed back into their own uniforms and got some sleep. An air raid then caused the camp's electric lighting to be shut down, slowing the escape even more. At around 1am, the tunnel collapsed and had to be repaired. Despite these problems, 76 men crawled through to freedom, till around at 4.55am on the 25th of March, the 77th man was spotted emerging by one of the guards. Those already in the trees began running, while the New Zealand squadron leader, Leonard Henry Trent, VC, who had just reached the tree line, stood up and surrendered. The guards had no idea where the tunnel entrance was, so they began searching the huts, giving men time to burn their fake papers. Hut 104 was one of the last to be searched, and despite using dogs, the guards were unable to find the entrance. Finally, German guardman Charlie Plitz crawled back through the tunnel, but found himself trapped at the camp end. He began calling for help, and the prisoners opened the entrance to let him out, finally revealing its location. In reality, there were no escapes by aircraft or motorcycle. McQueen himself requested the motorcycle sequence to show off his skills as a motorcyclist. He did all the stunt riding himself, except for the final jump, which was done by Bud Eakins. In the film, Captain Hiltz, played by Steve McQueen, incapacitates a German soldier for his motorcycle. Ashley Pitt kills a Gestapo officer when he recognises Bartlett waiting to pass through a Gestapo checkpoint at a railway station, and Headley knocks out a German guard at the airfield. Sedgwick witnesses the killing of German officers at a French calf by the French resistance. However, in real life, no German personnel were killed or injured by the escapees. Three truckloads of recaptured POWs drive in three directions. One truck contains 20 prisoners who are invited to stretch their legs in a field, whereupon they are all machine gunned in a single massacre, with the implication that the other two have the same manner. In reality, the POWs were shot individually or in pairs. The majority of the POWs were killed by pistol shots taken by Gestapo officers. However, at least 10 of them were killed in a manner like that portrayed in the film. Of 76 escapees, 73 were captured and the film depicts the three prisoners who escaped freedom as British, Polish and Australian. In reality, they were Norwegian, Jens Muller and Per Bergsland, and Dutch, Bram van der Stock. Seven POWs returned to Stalag Love Free in 2009 for the 65th anniversary of the escape and watched the film. 
According to the veterans present, many details of the first half depicting life in the camp were authentic. For example, the death of Ives who tried to scale the fence and the actual digging of the tunnels. The film has kept the memory of the 50 executed airmen alive for decades and has made their story known worldwide, if in a distorted form. To sum it all up simply, The Great Escape is a heavily fictionised version of a historical event during the Second World War, blending truth with poetic licence to produce the entertaining movie that we love today.